year by Joshua Bell, one of the best classical musicians. He won a Grammy for Best Musician in 1993. So what it was was, you've probably been to the Lenfant Plaza metro station. The idea was in the middle of rush hour during this extremely inconvenient time during a mundane setting, would, you be, would beauty be able to transcend that people could be aware and appreciate it? So here you have a musician three days before this little ex social experiment. It's basically $300 to $500 to $800 a ticket to see him play in the symphony in Boston. So here he is, rush hour, violin case open, playing with the most expensive violin in the world for one hour. And they wanted to see, will people be able to appreciate this? What happened was, because they filmed it, 1,097 people passed by Joshua though. And here he was, the, one of the best musicians in the world, extremely nervous because the fact is, the first 15, 20 minutes, not a single person stopped by to listen to what he was, what he was playing. He played six classical pieces. Over the course of 43 minutes, 27 people put a little bit of money into his violin case. So he made $32 and a little bit of change over the course of an hour. Five people out of 1,097 stopped by for more than one minute. Two of them were classical missions, getting their, after getting their master's degree in classical music and said, oh my god, it's Joshua Bell. <laughs> 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 Something must have happened if you get a break now. <laughs> one person ended up, they were tying their sneaker and they ended up in the midst of it saying, like, I might as well just stay here and just sit down and watch and listen to the music. And then two were children under seven years old. And it's really amazing when you watch the video of these little children that are mesmerized and their parents are pulling them away, like, come on, we have to wait, come on, it's rush hour, we gotta get out of here, there's too many crowds. And the children are still trying to get a glimpse of it, trying to listen a little bit longer. What it is, is it's a nice indication of the fact that our default mindset is to follow our routines, to be a little bit mindless drones, and fail to recognize all these amazing, beautiful, intriguing cues that are in our environment. And this sets up the idea of even though we all know what it feels like to be curious, this is not our default mindset. It's something that we can cultivate so it can be a stronger part of our life. So for me, what I've been doing over the course of, my, of the last 10 years of my career is basically address these questions of what is the good life? How can we achieve it? And it's very easy to raise your well-being a tiny bit. I mean, all I have to do is give you a free lobster dinner, make sure we give you a little, t a little free time so you have some incredible, intimate, passionate sex with someone that you love, spend some time hugging your children. Very easy to raise your mood. More difficult is to increase your well-being and then keep it at a sustained high level. So the question is, what are the mechanisms to get there? Science is starting to provide some of the answers. This is the counterpart to the secret and to the law of attraction and everything that sells more books and makes more money than Curious, which is in the lobby. <laughs> so when we think about well-being, you ask 50,000 people in surveys from 50 nations around the world, they say the primary objective of their life is to obtain happiness. And they've always felt that was a very narrow idea of happiness equals achieving a good life. Because happiness is only a single dimension of it. This is the idea that life is satisfying, satisfying and you have an abundance of positive feelings over negative feelings. Useful. You should listen to anything I would say. If I was to say happiness is a bad thing, don't cultivate this in yourself, don't look for it in your loved ones. But when this is your primary objective of life, you've got yourself a nice internal struggle that you're never going to get out of. Because you can't control your emotions. If this was the case, if I was really anxious before I came up here, all given talks in front of audiences, and then your friends say, Max, come on, have it. You know this about. And we know just how incredibly effective this strategy is in terms of intervention. Now I'm calm and certainly I have this sort of Buddhist like mentality to go on stage now. Thank you. Our temperature affects our moods, our hormones affect our moods. Um, the person that scowls as we pass by them, outside of conscious awareness, will end up affecting our mood. Trying to control our moods that anxiety is bad and anger is bad is problematic because these are useful emotions in a lot of contexts. If I end up having problems with my landlord, and my goal is I want to make sure that he can reduce my rent or else I'm going to be out, I'm going to have to look for a new apartment, anger is more useful than joy. It depends on the situation. If my objective is I want to develop a strong and comforting relationship with my landlord, joy is more adaptive than anger. 
So the good life is more than that. And what you have on the screen behind me here is several different dimensions of well-being. Spirituality, creativity, playfulness, the need to feel a sense of belonging and be understood, the need to feel a sense of autonomy. I'm the author of my own life. It's not controlled by other people. And when I looked at well-being as being a matrix of all these different dimensions, and I looked at the literature of what's relevant to all these dimensions, the thing that kept on appearing was the idea of being curious, acting on it, exploring, discovering, trying to figure things out about yourself and about the world around you. So not all ingredients are equal when it comes to living well, living a good life and trying to attain well-being. These are gratuitous shots of my 22 and a half year old girls. And when it, then you have right here the very first time a child discovers the ocean. Now just to try to get into the mindset of a, of a one and a half year old seeing the ocean for the first time. Here's this big, huge, massive thing that has no boundaries looking at your feet. <laughs> it's sort of trying to figure out why this is happening. Is this a good thing? Will it suck me out? I can't see the end. Is this the new world? Is my house disappearing? Where is mom? It's a very interesting dimension of have this anxiety and fear as well as intrigue and curiosity at the same time. Probably can't see this too well with the light here, but this is her first discovery of a balloon. Mm -hmm. And it makes you realize of, of this, like this is what Buddhists talk about, the unborn Buddha mind, of seeing things for the first time, of appreciating all the different possibilities of something. So some of the research on curiosity. Mortality is a good outcome. To actually be alive is a good thing. And what we find is, there was a report just yesterday on NBC News about the increase in the rate of Alzheimer's far beyond what anyone expected in terms of the expectancies for 2020. We're finding some a nice initial evidence showing that when people act on their curiosity, they're exploring, they're trying to make meaning, trying to make connections between new things. They actually are creating new neural connections even at later stages of life, 60s, 70s, 80s, ends up showing some evidence that this reverses some of the cognitive decline as you get older and potentially prevents some of these degenerative brain diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Not by itself, but serving as some sort of adjunctive benefit. In terms of mortality, when you study people in old age homes in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, follow them for 10 years, what you find is that people that are more curious end up being more likely to be alive when you're following them 10 years later. Accounting for all the usual suspects, presence of cancer, hypertension, blood pressure, um, cigarettes, exercise habits, dieting habits, account for all of this, that those that are more curious more likely to be alive 15 years later. Just discovered a genetic linkage for the first time, same binding between intelligence and curiosity. What you find is, a lot of these studies, they find pan-Pacific islands where you can study basically the entire population. 2,800 children between, at the age of three followed them for eight years until they were 11. What they found was with those children that were the most curious, regardless of how intelligent they were at age three, were more likely to be intelligent at age 11. This idea of seeking out new experiences, trying to integrate it into my sense of self, trying to get an understanding, a better understanding of other people in the world, this exploratory process creates that ability to be able to process information better, to be able to make a better sense of the world around you. In terms of relationships, the number one thing that people complain to me about when I go on radio shows talking about curiosity is, I'm interested in other people, but no one ever asks me questions about my life when I'm at a cocktail party. Everyone only cares about themselves. How do you get other people to be curious in me? Because like, I can't figure out like, why nobody wants to know anything about me. You've all been to these cocktail parties where basically you ask them a single question. I heard you're writing a new book. How's that going? Two hours passed, three hours passed. You're talking, you're probing, you're still following on. You've got really good social skills. You're waiting for them to ask this one question about your life, and it just never happens. And this happens repeatedly. And this is how sort of my wife and I end up selecting people that we spend time with, which would tend to be much more recluse, is because most people just don't take an interest in your own life. These are higher level social skills about cultivating and developing meaningful, lasting relationships. Taking an interest in other people's lives, the degree to which we're interested when other people have positive events in other people's lives that have nothing to do with us. You get a promotion, has no impact on me, I don't live with you, you're not my roommate. You fell in love, 
We live on California, so we're just talking by phone, so I'll probably won't see them for the next five years. The degree to which I'm interested and share in your joys is more predictive of the satisfaction in our relationship, the commitment to that relationship, than what I'm there for you during difficult times providing social support. This idea of capitalizing on your positive experiences, being interested in your positive experiences. Would you please repeat that, that very last part? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. The idea of... That was fascinating, but I wanted to hear you say it again. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll say it in different words to make it sound more important. <laughs> <laughs> the degree to which we are interested and share in the joys and triumphs of other people that have nothing to do with us has is more predictive of the quality of our relationships, the commitment to our relationships from our end and their end than when we're there for them when things go wrong. So we provide social support when they're in pain, so that we're on the phone when they're in depressive funk. When we're there for them during the good times, when they have children, when they fall in love, when they have promotions, this is a powerful thing. But it just recently it hasn't been studied until 2002 with the very first study of the idea of maybe this is an important social skill, getting interested in the good things in other people's lives. Mindfulness. If you want to get a really nice, clear definition of mindfulness, you can't ignore that it has two different parts to it. The first one is what you tend to see in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the idea of being profoundly aware of what's happening as the present moment unfolds. So this is the idea of being, being able to direct your attention to what's happening, to be a sense of presence. But the second part usually gets lost, even by the great ones, Tekna Khan, John Kabat-Zinn, the idea that it's the quality of your attention of being this open, receptive, curious attitude towards whatever is the focus of your attention. Curiosity doesn't lead to mindfulness, it's part of mindfulness. This attitude of looking at things seemingly familiar, looking for what's novel in them. So when you go home and you see your romantic partner that you've been with for 15 years, do you let them fall into stereotypes and categories and labels of, I know everything about them? They start to tell a story and you're like, or this in your mind, you're not saying this out loud, hopefully, or you're still in your mind. You're saying to yourself, I've heard this a thousand times before, I'm going to clean the dishes as you talk, as you nod my head and say, oh, that's fantastic, honey. that's a great story for the 50th time. Or, if you attend to, what's unique and novel about this time, this story, this nuance, the nuances, this retelling of this story, this is the kind of, this is the kind of dimension, the kind of processes that sustains passion in long-term relationships something I'll talk about in a little bit. So like most scientists, I like to throw a bunch of variables into an ultimate fighting challenge, steel cage, death match to see which is the most valuable in terms of understanding happiness and well-being. So if you take 24 strengths and you throw them all into the mix, which is the most relevant to well-being? All those different dimensions I was talking about, happiness, meaning in life, creativity, achievement, being productive and happy at work. The usual suspects you think are the ones that end up being bestsellers in the New York Times. New York Times. So you've got emotional intelligence. Daniel Goleman can't write enough books about emotional I think we're at book number seven on emotional intelligence. It's always a bestseller, so we should just keep on going. Optimism. This is what you find. There's at least 15 books about optimism if you pop into Barnes & Noble's right now. Being a kind and compassionate person. Certainly good, good traits to cultivate in our children and ourselves. The Dalai Lama is saying that this is what we need to have a better society. You put all of these things, none of them are more strongly related to your own well-being, to having pleasurable moments in your life, to being engaged and energized during daily moments in your life, to finding meaning in your life than curiosity. The only ones that come close are being grateful and having enthusiastic and zestful. But there's actually, the idea of being enthusiastic and successful is part of being curious and trying to discover all these novel, this novel intrigue that we often pass by because we end up in this mindless state where we get so caught up in a routine that we don't pay attention to what's happening. That we, as soon as we meet someone, within five minutes of the conversation, we've already categorized what their personality is. If we were to walk away and someone asks you, hey, what's a coworker like who works right next to you? You can tell them all about their personality. You just lay it all down. They're, they're neurotic, they're pretty close-minded, they're pretty hostile. You can see we have a lot of problems. Five minutes, small slice of information, 
boom, we're already categorizing and boxing people, and it's very difficult to change those first impressions. If we're going to intervene to make our lives more satisfying and meaningful, it always starts with developing precise language for describing the positives. And by, by nature, human beings have a very impoverished language. We're very good at describing the negative. There's tons of words for negative emotions. If you, if, if you have kindergartners, or if you remember kindergarten, and you sort of, let's learn your emotion words, and you have the pictures of facial expressions, you've got happy somewhere in the middle, and then you have about 85 different facial expressions of negative emotions. We just don't have that discrimination for the positives in our lives. So let me for a second just kind of break down curiosity a little bit so it can start to think about how this applies to your life. Because for a lot of people, when I talk about curiosity, they say to themselves, I'm already interested in things. I mean, if I was to listen to an a cappella group of 80-year-olds singing punk rock, punk rock songs, Sonic Youth, Talking Heads, Jimi Hendrix, The Breeders, The Pixies, whatever sort of documentary Young at Heart, they actually detail this, this a cappella group from Boston. You don't need me to tell you to be curious. It's very intriguing to listen to a bunch of eight-year-olds sing, sing dead vocaling songs. It's, Dead Kennedy's vacation to Cambodia. You don't, your curiosity is natural. It doesn't fit with your idea of what 80-year-olds do. Why? They're interested in sonic music. They love really dissonant three-chord songs. That's awesome. In this case, if you're walking through a forest and a rain, so let's assume this is a rainbow-colored moth. I couldn't find a picture of a rainbow-colored moth. <laughs> and a rainbow-colored moth lands on your shoulder, I don't need you to tell you it's really good for you to start to be curious and start to look at it, observe it, and see kind of how this is different from other insects in your life. You're going to be naturally curious. If you go into a high school classroom and all the kids are wearing Barry Manilow t-shirts, I don't need to tell you to be curious. So, what you mean with these kids? <laughs> so this would be what we call bottom-up curiosity, which is we see obscure, bizarre, interesting, novel things in our world, and we just naturally, almost spontaneously become curious. Obviously, so you can easily force them within only a few minutes. <laughs> so that, so we start to talk about the curiosity in terms of bottom up. We just naturally feel curious. But where we can feel this strength is top-down curiosity. And that's the idea of taking this intentional mindset of looking for the novel distinctions of things we think we already know. And so this is basically the problem, is once you become an expert in something, you stop paying attention. And so if you see a therapist who has 50 years of experience, and I know because I'm on the other side and I talk to therapists with 30, 50 years of experience, a good portion of them, not all of them, a good portion of them will come to another therapist and say, You'll talk about a case and say, I've seen this case a thousand times before. This is what you have to do with this client. They never even saw the person. They heard you talking about the case. Or when you, te you teach your class, and you've got, this is your troublemaker. This is your weird kid who's going to say completely unrelated comments throughout the entire semester. They're going to be talking about how children play with toys, and then she'll raise her hand and say, adrenal gland. Has nothing to do with it. And the whole semester will be you trying to regulate this bizarre behavior <coughs> of this person. Instantaneously, it was like, I know what this person's like. I'm going to try to avoid them the entire semester that I'm working with them. Or, like I said, our romantic partners. We spent 30 years with someone. We assumed that we could write an encyclopedia about their entire autobiography, their entire biography, about what, who they are, what their interests are, what their likes are. But we're still evolving and growing. But I can define and describe everyone else very clearly and write a biography about everybody else. We turn off our awareness. We turn off that open receptive attitude. And we fall back onto categories and stereotypes and labels. This is the shutdown when it comes to allowing a relationship to be fed and to continue to grow. So one of the mantras that I have is that you can't always be happy, but you can almost always be profoundly aware and curious. This is a mindset that we have to enter into we cultivate top-down, starting to look at things intentionally, reminding ourselves to be there in the present moment and see what opportunities, what growth opportunities are there for us. That's just my intro. So we're going to talk about three things today. What makes people curious? How do curious people handle their pain? We're going to do some, show you some really cool, bizarre stuff fresh out of my laboratory about how curious people deal with reminders of their own death. And then I'm going to be talking about how do you nourish curiosity.
so, a lot of this stuff is brand spanking new, so we'll see what happens. Who knows if this will, you'll even like any of these things. <laughs> so is curiosity more than just lust for new experiences and information? The idea is, is it more than just recognizing that there is, there's something bizarre, obscure, mysterious, uncertain, unpredictable, and novel? You know, this is what makes us curious. The rainbow-colored monk, the 80-year-old who sings Sonic Youth songs. Or is there something more to being curious? If you like me and you like these National Geographic episodes, I like warfare between different species. Dominators versus hippos, that was always the one I loved as a kid. I'll watch that thousands of times. Because I always thought as a kid that the alligator would be the hippo until I learned more about hippos. This is always novel, uncertain, and unpredictable. The scenario, even if you live in Africa, a hippo chasing after you, this is not a curious person that's sort of behind me right here. There's something else than just recognizing the new and unfamiliar. You have to feel that you can be able to cope and handle the new or unfamiliar, or else you're not going to be curious. That anxiety is going to be overwhelming. So it's this two-pronged process, recognizing the new mysterious and uncertain and unpredictable, and can you handle it? handle this ambiguity? Can you handle this novelty? So this dude on the left, I, I, this is found in Madagascar, a really ugly looking bastard. This, so this is, you got rodent teeth, you have this, what's, what's famous for the I, I is having this wooden middle finger where it taps on trees and then it breaks it open and then rips out grubs and eats it with his middle finger. Um, not, not a very pleasant thing. Definitely novel, definitely bizarre and mysterious. You're not going to touch this thing if, if you find this thing floating around on your doorstep if, as you get home from work before you walk inside. You're probably going to kick it aside or go through the back door. But as you see someone holding it, all of a sudden, hey, how bad can it I, I actually be? So it makes you all of a sudden realize it's not only novel, but I feel as if I can handle it. I want to touch this strange looking creature as well. On the right side is this really cool dude. The adulte. This is a tiger salamander that you find in Mexico. So when you see this face, so you're, if you're just strolling around Mexico and Tijuana and you see the adulte close up, with this little face right here, evolutionarily designed to you go and pet it, you're going to feel like it's really bizarre seeing a happy face on a little tiny creature. And they can't bother look how happy he looks, the adulte. So you're going to pick it up and you're going to have, you're going to feel like you can cope and you're going to feel as if this is novel and you're going to be really intrigued and curious until it takes its claws and rips open your skin and starts eating the blood right out of your arteries, which is what the adult thing normally does. If you are watching this, you will never look at this happy face again and be curious. You're going to be quite fearful the next time you see an adult thing. But the first time you see an adult thing, you'll be, you know, now you won't. You'll be, you to be curious and feel that you can handle it. It was evolutionarily designed for the idea, look at my face, of course you can handle this novelty. Come pick me up so I can eat and drink all of it. So clearly novelty isn't enough in terms of being curious. And so my colleague and I in North Carolina, we actually studied this, focusing on people who have a real strong appreciation and knowledge of art, or at least they say they do, and then people like myself who love art but will readily attest to the fact that I have no idea what I'm supposed to be looking at as people talk about postmodernism and post-postmodernism when I'm in a museum in Florence. So, what we did was we took people in the beginning of the semester, the extreme high scores of I know everything about art, and then people who would say, like myself, that um, this is just, I'm just not comfortable with complicated art. And they viewed 30 pictures, really simple things, just hexagons and pentagons, and then we moved towards sort of Salvador Dali as we get to the end of really complicated pictures. And what we're interested in was the idea that if it's just novelty, the more complicated the picture, the more everyone should be exploring and spending time paying attention to a picture. But if there's something about being able to handle the novelty, it's only the people that really are confident they can appreciate and understand art that will be focusing and spending a lot of time with the complicated pictures. And so what you find is, is that when the pictures are really simple, there's not much difference between people that are low and high in their art ability. But when things get really complicated, all of a sudden, you know, we're not talking about the Salvador Dali painting that ends up being a poster in everyone's dorm room with the cough melting. He's got some really bizarre stuff once he started playing with the psychedelics. Once it gets really complicated, you find that those that have a low knowledge of art, they kind of stop paying any more attention as things get more complicated. 
But for people that are very knowledgeable in art, they're paying, this is the time they spend viewing pictures. They're spending more and more time. They're engaged, they're actively engaged. They're exploring these things. They want to understand these things in great depth. Where these people are more likely to disengage through these very complicated pictures. It's a combination of recognizing and appreciating novelty, feeling as if you can tolerate the ambiguity of novelty. So I have some, some people from my research team that will be walking around your neighborhood pretending to be lost horse. And you are the guy who looks like Santa Claus. That's you. So they're going to approach you. And so here's the question. If you're talking to my research assistants pretending to be a lost tourist, how many of you will be able to recognize in the middle of the conversation if the person actually changes that you're talking to? Just raise your hand. Would you, would you, do you think you'd be able to recognize it? If the person that you were talking to in the middle of the conversation, giving them directions, changed? It's a new person who will appear. Something happens. So I'm going to do something in the middle of this, of you talking to them, that's going to just take you out of the picture for a second. Oh, look, there's a meteor falling. And the person's going to change that you're talking to. How many of you are going to recognize that? Yeah. So 90% of people say they're going to recognize it, only 50% do. So this is what happens. This is the experiment. So the guy on the left is my, is my stooge. He's pretending to be a lost tourist, asked Santa Claus for directions. All of a sudden, in the middle of them talking, oh, what do you know? There's this piece of furniture that's going to be moved that's going right between the two of you guys who are talking. And if you look, there's, now, there's two guys beside the person carrying the piece of furniture. And they switch places. And now Santa Claus is talking to a completely different person. Only 50% of the time when asked, um, how was that conversation? Yeah, that's right. Anything interesting happened to you? <laughs> Two totally different people, even underneath their jackets, different shirts. What happens is, when we think we know something, we stop paying attention. This has been studied dozens of times in very weird ways. You're talking to a hotel clerk who's a student in a study, and all of a sudden they say, and you're working through your bill, and they say, excuse me for a second, I've got to tie my shoe. A new person comes up. <laughs> 90% of people say, of course I would recognize it. Only 50% at most do. Even weirder, you're looking at a photograph of a man and a woman, and then all of a sudden they say, did you realize how much gum is on the ceiling here? Switch the photographs, switch the heads. One's a man, one's a woman. A man and a woman switch their heads. Only 50% of people at most notice that the heads change in the picture. This is what they're doing, by the way. Their only thing they're doing is looking at the picture. We can't pay attention to everything. This is, we have a limited attentional span. We have a limited working memory. And the fact is, is that because we are, our brains like to use as little cognitive processing ability as possible, it likes to focus on, focus on something, label something, box it, categorize it, so it can use more energy if someone starts throwing samurai swords and ninja stars at you, that your survival is potentially at risk here. So it so saves energy for survival and passing on your genes. So in case someone on the street says, I'm ready to have a baby with you, you can say, I have enough energy. I can do that. I wasn't really paying attention to Santa Claus. I can do that right now. Your brain doesn't care whether you're happy and mindful. Your brain cares about surviving and passing on your genes. Once we think we know something, we stop paying attention. This also applies a very simple intervention. Stop assuming that you know things. So another thing that interferes with curiosity besides this default state of being mindless is the potential of danger. Uh, when we approach something new, like the II or the Jolte, we have this mixture of anxiety and this mixture of intrigue at the same time. So we have this nice seesaw battle. Do I act on my curiosity and explore the II and pet it with the possibility, again, of this wooden middle finger that could go up my nose and pull something out that I don't want to? Or do I act on my anxiety and say, you know what? That's those rodent teeth, Madagascar, I don't know that much about it besides the, the Pixar film. I think I'm going to stay with the eye. Act on my anxiety and I'm going to avoid it and go watch Netflix movie instead. This is the battle that we face on a regular basis. This conflict between when we face the new and unfamiliar, acting on our anxiety or acting on our curiosity. But perhaps 
if we're open and curious about these negative thoughts and feelings we have, we can transform how we relate to our anxiety. Not get rid of it, but change the way we relate to it. So I've been doing some really bizarre stuff on confronting death, because most people that study happiness just don't study death. So I think this is a nice combination to bring these two worlds together, death and happiness. So this is the ultimate threat that any of us face as humans, and because we are aware of our own mortality, there's this omnipresent potential for anxiety. And how we normally manage this, this, this idea that we're going to die, is we end up defending our cultural worldviews. That's my psychological jargon, the only one I'll probably use today. So we defend these cultural worldviews. What these are is these are these fundamental views, these values that are at the core of who we are as a person. It could be my patriotism for my country. It could be my linkage with my gender, my linkage with my race. Very, very concrete, very clear, very fundamental to who I am. And how it usually manifests itself in defending my cultural worldview is that I show lots of love and praise to people that share similar views, share my, share my race or ethnicity of a similar gender, pro-US versus being anti-US or people that aren't like me or they're against my views, I'm very hostile and aggressive. So this makes sense if you think about it. I'm reminded of the fact I'm going to die. And then if I can link up with these groups, these groups that are gonna live longer than me, my gender's gonna live longer than me, my racial group's gonna live longer than me, my country will live longer than me. So in a sense, I have a sense of symbolic immortality. I've got this permanent sense of self as long as I connect myself to it. So this, gives, so this is something, this is a nice way to defend myself against the, the likelihood or the knowledge that I'm going to die. Reminder of your own mortality that you're going to die, this existential anxiety, this dread is heightened, you become even more defensive. Loving people that are like you, showing hatred and aggression towards people that aren't like you. But here's the kicker, what makes it really interesting. This all happens on the fringes of conscious awareness. So we're not aware of this process that happens. When you're reminded of your own death, all of a sudden, when someone, if you're an atheist and someone's very religious wearing a huge wrapper, 10 pound cross around their neck, uh, all of a sudden when they say, hey, listen, I'm gonna go to the bathroom, can you put some hot sauce on my sandwich for me? If you're reminded of your death, so on the screen comes a video of the Twin Towers going down, and this situation, this is a very bizarre scenario here. Twin Towers are going down on the television screen, you look up, some, some extremely religious person tells you, I'm gonna to go to the bathroom, put hot sauce on my sandwich for me. You are more likely to put hot sauce, extreme amounts of hot sauce on someone that's religious as opposed to someone who's atheist. <laughs> Asked why, you will say, I didn't like what they were wearing, they seem to have an attitude. You have no idea that the reminder of your own death by looking at the screen, of seeing the Twin Towers go down, has any impact. We're very good at creating post hoc explanations for why we do things. So what we did in these series of studies is we prime people about their death to think about it and see what weird things happen outside of their conscious awareness. If you don't think this is relevant, this is happening all over the world right now, is here you have um, in Arabic of saying that basically everyone in the US, we should all die. These are reminders of our own mortality are all over the place. They're influencing us, they're affecting our well-being, but we're not usually cognizant of this. I'm not interested in doing another study showing that being reminded of our own death on the fringes of conscious awareness makes us into hatred, people that hate people that aren't like us and show love to people that are like us. I'm interested in the potential resilience factor. And if, what if we are more open and aware about and curious about these difficult emotional experiences that we have? Instead of more automatically becoming rigid when we get anxious and angry, and spontaneously, reflexively act out towards people that we think are doing wrong feelings to us, we actually sort of spend time contemplating, open to what this emotion potentially provides information about, about my experiences, about the things that affect me. If you tend to be aware of what happens in the present moment and open about what experience offer, potentially offer you, could this offset these defensive reactions when your identity is threatened? by being reminded of your own death. Anyone need a clarification to that? This is a kind of bizarre study that I'm talking about here. Reminded of your own death, you end up showing this worldview defense, 
hatred towards people that aren't like you, love towards people that are like you. The idea if you're open, aware, and curious, maybe this might buffer that so you don't see these defensive reactions. You can experience threats just like everybody else, but be non-defensive about it. Still have a reaction, but be non-defensive about it. So in this first study, we had people fill out a measure of mindfulness. What we did was had them write about their own death or dental pain. Because we wanted to make sure it wasn't about just putting people into a bad mood. So you were asked to write about what's it going to be like when you die. And I want real grisly details about your decomposing body, worms crawling in and out of your eye sockets, the skin, the flesh dripping off of your face. I want you to get all that in there. And then tell me about, have you ever had a dentist put a drill and bore through one of your molars? If you did, I want it to sound, the smell it had when the drill went through that all of a sudden started sharpening all over the place and describe it in great detail. Little delay. Then you're asked, you know what, this is part of a different study, can you read these couple of essays? They're supposedly written by foreigners. One is saying how much America sucks, and one is saying how great America is. They're both written by foreigners. So what you expect is, when you're reminded of your own death, you show, asked about the likability or intelligence of the authors of these essays, people that write pro-USA essays, they're amazing people. These anti-US people, they're not intelligent, their arguments are bad, their grammar is bad, sounds like it's like, are they in third grade, the person who wrote this? And again, when you're asked why, you said, um, you know, it's just a bad writer. Nothing to do with the fact that we're about my own death. Scary spot, scary grammar. <laughs> so what you find is this is the preference for the writer who says that the US is amazing. If it's negative, you're saying there's a preference for the right person who writes an anti-US essay. What you find is those people that are low in mindfulness, they end up showing the strong preference for people that are writing positive things about the US, reminded of their own death, particularly so. So this showing, this showing an extreme preference for people that are writing positive things about the US and showing extreme dislike about the people that are writing things about, that are against the United States. But the mindful people, they're not showing a preference for either one. Now, both writers, it was designed to be that they were both written great arguments. The only difference was, was one was saying good things or bad things about the US. Remind them of their own death. Mindful people aren't having these defensive reactions about it. They're able to just experience what the author is writing as opposed to having this extreme reaction of, you're challenging my ideas and values, my core values. So we did it. We actually did seven studies. I'll just show you two of them. The other one was about immorality. Same exact procedure, except at the end, what they did was read, read vignettes of people engaging in extreme moral transgressions. So as an example, you'd read an essay about a doctor that smoked some weed right before they did surgery and they ended up cutting off the wrong person's leg. Supposed to cut off the right leg for amputation. They cut off the left leg. Now they come back. The person to come back and they get the right leg removed. Now they have no legs at all because the guy ended up was high when he was doing the surgery. So these are the, and you're rating the severity of the wrongdoing, how much they should be punished. And you find the exact same thing, is that the harshness of judgment, those people that are low in mindfulness and remind you of going death, they're showing the harshest reactions. It's horrible, they should get the death sentence, very extremist black and white thinking in terms of this is, this is completely unacceptable for social behavior. Those that are in mindful, they're not having that reaction when reminded of their own death. What they're saying is that, is that they're looking at this individually. Is that in some cases, the event warrants a punishment, in other cases, it doesn't. They're recognizing the fact that they're looking at the situations themselves as opposed to being pulled by this non-conscious reaction to being reminded of your own death. They're in control of being able to manage their emotional experiences. They're open to processing this difficult emotional material. And so we ask why. Why are people that are more mindful able to sort of resist this defensive reaction when they're reminded of their own mortality? And what we found was, was that those people that were aware and extremely curious about their experiences, they wrote more about their death and they used more death-related words. So they weren't hiding from their own mortality. They were directly confronting it. They were talking about their coffin. They were talking about their dead body. They were describing the worms going inside and outside of their eyes. Whether it's low in mindfulness, we're describing just the idea that it would probably be an unpleasant thing. So they're avoiding the death-related words. They're kind of just, just it's, a, it's a nice, useful strategy. In some cases, distancing yourself from the event. 
If you are an EMT worker on a regular basis, we're dealing with people with heroin overdoses or being killed on the streets, it's useful to have a distancing response to regulate your emotions. You know, this is not a time for empathy and compassion because you have to deal very spontaneously and immediately in life and death scenarios. Ex avoiding those unpleasant emotions is adapted in that moment. The problem is, is when they go back home, they end up being exhausted from all the energy of trying to control and to suppress and hide and conceal their feelings. So there's two interesting outcomes of these seven studies. One is that things outside of conscious awareness do impact our well-being and we don't even know it. Because all of us were around when 9 11 happened, you didn't realize you were being affected. If you were a mindful person, it probably had less of an impact on it. And the other thing is that when we're aware and curious, it tempers our reactions when our identity, our core sense of self is threatened. We end up being much more open to difficult experiences. So let me just finish up with some ideas of how to cultivate curiosity. So with curiosity being a part of being mindfulness, the best techniques to cultivate curiosity is some of the mindfulness strategies that are out there. The idea of engaging in an activity with the sense of being aware of what's happening in the present moment and not relying on habits, stereotypes, and categories when you're spending time with people or when you're doing something. So if you're in a yoga class, the first, it's your first yoga class. One of the first, because my wife was a yoga instructor, the first response of first time yoga, yoga students is, I'm never gonna be able to contort my body the way that those people that are next to me. Like they're able to put their head against their feet. That's fantastic, but I'll never get there. They're judging themselves during this experience to be a social comparison. Mindfulness is gone. That's, at that moment, mindfulness disappears. The idea is not so much of to be better or worse at yoga, it's to be in touch with how you breathe, how your muscles move. When your hands are on the ground, are your elbows out or your elbows in? Are your triceps extended? Are they being activated or are they loose and relaxed? Of recognizing, being really in touch with your physical body, your breathing, and being able to calmly attend to what's happening in your mind without being pulled out of the present moment. Recognizing I'm having, I'm having the thought that I, should, I don't belong here because I'm not athletic. You see, the, you see what I just did there? I added one little bit of distancing. Of, I'm having the thought that I don't belong here, as opposed to what really happens in real life is, I don't belong here. And we just listen as if our mind is always right. Our mind isn't always with us. I'm not talking about dualism, that the mind is separate from the body, but our mind is, we think all the time. Our mind produces thoughts all the time. How we respond to them, this is something that we can learn to change the way we relate to our thoughts. It's not a literal representation of reality. When you have the thought, when I talk to that, I'm gonna run out of things to say. That's not a literal representation because it didn't happen yet. It's a possible future. So I can listen to it, get very anxious to decide, and tell Lois, I have a stomach ache, I'm not gonna to talk today. Or say, thank my mind for that thought. I realize my mind is having the thought that I might run out of things to say. And all of a sudden, it doesn't have the emotional sting to it. I can have the thought and still pursue the things that I care about. You don't have to do yoga and meditation. It could be just spending time with your kids about being profoundly aware in the present with an open attitude. This means those labels you have, my kid is quiet, my kid is highly spirited, which are my kids, my kids are running off all over the place. My kids are rebellious, my kids don't listen to me. All these labels get in the way of me experiencing the present moment in this moment. They can be completely loving, caring, and listening, or they can be disobedient or something in between. As long as I'm labeling and categorizing, I'm not living and experiencing it. All I'm doing is I'm going through the prism of my thoughts and expectations about the moment. You can be mindful as you're preparing a meal. You can be mindful as you're dancing. You can be mindful as you're mowing your lawn. There's a great book by Aldous Huxley called The Island, where it's this idea of this paradise, and all children in school are trained not just about topics, but to learn how to use their body in the most efficient manner of how their bodies are designed. So how do you actually mow the lawn or grow flowers in terms of bending your knees, bending your back, so you actually are most attuned with how your body, the muscles, the joints operate in your body? This is something that's completely foreign in Western culture, of teaching people how to be really in touch with what their body does, what's an inefficient motion, what's an efficient motion, 
what could be most useful so I could be in touch with this experience and not have back pain and not have and not have sort of experiences where I can't be there enjoying the thing that I want to do, which was plant flowers, appreciate what the dirt feels like, appreciate making sure it gets in there so it can be the most nourished when it rains. One of the ways we become curious is when there's recognized the gap between what we know and what we want to know. How many people here about free economics? Red free economics. Yeah. So this is one of the big questions that's in the book. If you remember this, I'd be impressed because when it comes for me for reading, I forget two days after I read the book. Mm -hmm. So they ask this question, why do drug dealers still live with their moms? This is a really interesting point to describe this idea, this information gap. We know a lot about drug dealers, at least we think we do. You know, they're rich, they have this really adventurous lifestyle, most of them are men, so they have tons of women, they've got a harem of women, they're in access to it any time they want to. They sort of rule that little fightdom where they have control and power over the people. Um, so we have this knowledge, and then we have this fact that I'm telling you, that most drug dealers live with their moms. Now this kind of is a little bit counterintuitive. So now I've just created a gap to be interested about. Well, that's kind of weird. That's not, I normally think of drug dealers in all the movies I've seen in Scarface. You'd see him, you'd, you'd, you'd see him living with his mom in the movie. This, you know, why is that the case? And the reason is because 93% of drug dealers make less than minimum wage. Because they end up being the small drug dealers for the big kingpins. So what happens is they have to pass on, such a, to be part of the business, to work their way up, they have to pass on all their money to the big kingpins. So financially, they can't live on their own. And most mothers of big drug dealers and the little drug dealers working for the big drug dealers are in impoverished neighborhoods where that little tiny bit of money that's just about minimum wage actually helps them, for them to survive on their own. They usually end up being less educated, less qualified into the workplace, having a hard time finding jobs themselves. So in a sense, it's really adapted for both of them to live with each other. So this goes against our image, it sort of, it, what it does, it creates intrigue. There are these moments all over the place in terms of what we know, what we think we know, and then there's a gap there. If I go scuba diving with a marine biologist, and all of a sudden we see a bunch of translucent orange fish with black horizontal stripes. And me being someone who's not that, you know, that a big fishing out in terms of knowing my fishies, I'll be like, oh, that's really cool. It glows, it's illuminated, that's it's a good looking fish. And he's like, and he responds and says, yeah, that's a very beautiful fish. And then we're swimming it's about two hours later, and all of a sudden we find some translucent orange fish with vertical black stripes. <laughs> and I say, oh, there they are again. That's cool, that's those cute little fishies from before. He says, no. No, they're horizontal, and that's so bizarre because that species would never be in water this cold. Must have tell us tons of things about climate control. So he's down there for a multitude of hours of this horizontal, vertical striped orange fish. For me, I'm like, I've seen these things before earlier today, and I'm already up talking, smoking a cigarette with everyone else on the boat. But because he has more knowledge about fish, it opens all these doors about climate control and temperatures or temperature of the water that has nothing to do with my life because I don't have access to that information. Knowledge actually opens up doors about things to be curious about. The more we know, we start to recognize these little gaps about things. This is one of my favorite line of, line of studies, which is how can we transform activities that we rule out ahead of time that we've never done before because they're, they're going to be boring. So you've got women that talk about how they hate football, you've ever watched a game, no. You've got bodybuilders in terms of crochet, I would never do that, only grandmothers do crochet. You've got so many college students in my classes all the time where I ask them, oh, you saw a beautiful mind. Have you ever read the book? No, I prefer to watch the movies, I'm not really interested in biographies. And so what you do in these studies is you have people do the thing that they've already ruled out prematurely with the one objective of find three novel, interesting things about it. So the reason I brought up Beautiful Mind is they did a little pilot study with this, uh, finding a bunch of college students that like watching the movies but don't watch them reading the books about biographies. Because anyone that does read biographies knows that the movies miss so many of the details. And so to get people interested in the potential of maybe the biographies are better despite the fact that we might have great actors in these movies, Beautiful Mind being a fantastic movie. 
So what we found of having people read the biography of John Nash, the Nobel Prize winning mathematician in A Beautiful Mind, is so what did they find to be intriguing? And the answers people found were that was really weird. In the movie, they completely didn't talk anything about his bisexuality. That he had these incredible crushes on grad students, and due to his power, he took advantage of a lot of situations and ended up having these sexual liaisons with their grad students, male grad students. Who doesn't talk about that? Throughout the entire book, they talk about how this incredibly physically built, powerful, strong looking man, but they never described him ever working out. Like it must be like pure, absolute genetics. Like clearly he's working on these formulas all day long. In this case, you have some people that are so much genetics are involved in their physical, their physical, um, you know, the build, that they don't have to work out at all. That was kind of fascinating. And other people would talk about how he was such a dick to Albert Einstein. So when he met Albert Einstein and John Nash and went into his office and said, I've got some new ideas that can improve your theory of relativity. And he just walked into his office, walked right over to his blackboard and started writing down his formulas. Now Albert Einstein said, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know why I let a grad student meet with him in the first place. So the book talks about that in detail. In the movie, they don't discuss this incident. And there's a couple of other really great geniuses that meet John Nash. Von Neumann and Oppenheimer and all these people thought he was this very prickly, annoying, rebellious grad student. So it's interesting that they found that a lot of geniuses can't pick out other future geniuses. So all this gets missed in the movie. And what happens is, when you ask people to do something that they prematurely ruled out, not to find something enjoyable, but something interesting, and you follow them up, they're more likely to engage in that activity again. If you do it in terms of looking for joy, you don't find this effect. But when you look for something that's interesting, of, wow, this opens up a lot of doors in terms of really getting a lot of information about things I care about that I would miss if I only watched the movies. You follow up a few weeks later, they said, I just started another biography about X. And you find the same thing for football, for crochet, um, for poetry, classical literature. They said, we, we see what we're expecting to look for. We can change that mindset. We can transform the way we relate to activities. Just as before, I was talking about we could transform the way we relate to negative thoughts and experiences. When we, when we think about how we describe ourselves as a person, or we describe other people, we often have these unconditional statements. I'm extroverted. My, I have a twin brother, and I have twins. My twin brother, our entire lives have been described of me being described as very sociable and gregarious, and my twin's entire life, oh, he's the shy one. He's the quiet one. What happens is these end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whether it's other people describing someone, you describing yourself, or you describing other people. The fact is, is that we don't have these rigid personality descriptors. In different situations, brings out different behaviors and tendencies. So around your family, if someone was to watch you, they may say you're very shy and quiet. Around your friends, they may say you're the life of the party, you're freaking hilarious. Depends on the situation. The slight change in language of saying, instead, I'm not, a, I'm not a courageous person, or I am a courageous person, and saying, I might be a courageous person, leaving that open, openness for possibility changes the way people describe themselves, changes the way people respond in situations. When you do this in studies, and you change the way, this slight modification of language, it changes their consciousness. Nietzsche talked about this. Language dictates consciousness. When you say, I could be, I might be a courageous person, you throw some into a morally ambiguous situation where they're taking a test in a room and the instructor happens to accidentally leave the answers on the front of the desk. Those people that describe themselves as, I'm not a courageous person, are, are much less likely to resist going to look at the test answers. When they say, I'm sorry, to say that, that, yeah, I'm not a courageous person, but those that say, I might be a courageous person, they're more likely to show resistance, to show that moral courage in the situation of, even though the answers are right there, this is not something that's sort of morally correct to do. If I, if I was walking around right now, I do this when I'm in middle school, so I don't do this when I'm with adults, with an enema. Um, so you have this, an old school enema, so the glass enema with like a little rubber stopper at the bottom, you can squeeze the enema. enema. And you tell kids what an enema is, and you say, this is an enema. What can you do with it? And with a bunch of other kids, you say, this could be an enema. What could you do with it? And you're asking for, what are the other uses? 
you find about five to ten times as more possible uses when you say, this might be an enemy. It might not. You've never seen one before. You don't know what it looks like. You have to trust me. I'm just some random person standing on the stage. The idea of just a slight having this conditional language, slight change, increases creativity. Creative thinking about ourselves, about other people, opens up possibilities, opens up doors. This last point is the idea of what my perspective is about a good life. For me, a good life is not about achieving happiness. It's about clarifying what values are at the core of who you are. You know, do you want to be a good father or a good mother? Do you want to be a good friend? Do you want to take care of the environment? These are abstract values. You can't complete them. I can't complete the idea of being a good father. I can create goals that are linked up with those values to get a little bit more concrete. Uh, so I'm going to make sure I go home every day at work at 5 o'clock so I can have three hours with them before they go to sleep. Now I just went from a goal to having behaviors I could potentially engage in on a daily basis. When we live in a way that's aligned with our core values, central values, and do what, do what matters to us, this is a good life. On the path of doing that, we might catch happiness along the way sometimes, but not all the time. If, the, if you have a value of, I want to create children that are moral, compassionate people that can contribute to society, some of the goals will be, I have to, I have to reprimand them and explain to them when they do things wrong. This will not increase your happiness. There's nothing pleasant about telling a kid of they did something that's wrong that hurt someone else's feelings and what do you think the consequence of it are? But it's aligned with that value of in the process of this, of in the process of concrete behaviors of talking to your child about something they did wrong to create a more compassionate child that can be a better steward to a better society. Sometimes it will lead to happiness when you see later on at a future date when they see someone else bullying somebody and they intervene and protect someone who's being victimized, and you'll smile and be pretty happy about that experience. But at the moment when they're crying and saying, I didn't know what I did wrong, I hate you, and they lock themselves in their room, your happiness is going to increase. Living a life we value, part of the process of clarifying your values is turning that curiosity inward of discovering what are the things that I live for? What is, what is the architectural framework that I want to be my life? If I was to have someone to describe my life, what do I want it to describe? The compasses that direct me to invest my limited attention and energy in this way as opposed to that way. If we don't know what our values are, we're going rudderless through the ocean in terms of figuring out our lives. So what I do in a lot of workshops is help people clarify and discover their values, their strengths, and create goals that are aligned with them. So they can start to figure out of the life that I'm living, maybe the reason that I'm not satisfied is this, these things have nothing to do with what I value. These are things that just spontaneously give me bursts of pleasure every once in a while. But that's not my value. My value is about taking care of my family. My value is about being a good person. So just to wrap this up, I can't see the clock because the light is right exactly on the clock right now, so I have no idea what time it is. Um, is that 109? Let's go to 115. I'm sorry for babbling for so long. <clears throat> the nature of curiosity, part of its recognized novelty, part of its the ability, the perceived ability that you can handle novelty. It's key to various parts of what good life is about. We can cultivate it if we intentionally search for novel distinctions in the present moment. If we schedule this is an exercise or dieting, this is not something you can just do and all of a sudden become a more curious, open-minded person. You have to actually practice this with great intention. Thank you. And let me just open it to any questions on any topic, anywhere, anything. Related or unrelated. Um, I give, I've given workshops at the Ministry of Health in Iceland, and I just gave one at Nova on Friday to 300 people that have 300 employees at Nova. So it's all over the place. Yeah, but how do you make passion? Finding, finding a calling as opposed to having a career. So you're not into positive affirmations, but more like open affirmations, kind of? Um, what do you call them? Open affirmations? And, and instead of saying, I am curious. Right. Like, you know, I, I'm going to say that every day to myself. And yeah. Telling myself? Yeah, I'm definitely not saying that. Huh? I'm definitely not saying that. Yeah.
No, there's actually a lot of research that shows that these positive affirmations have a, an adverse effect on our well-being because this is the secret. The idea of, oh, you can manifest any destiny you want to is possible. Well, no. If you're an amputee, there's nothing you can say or do to bring back limbs. Your own limbs. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to win the lottery just by thinking about it. So the affirmation is, is almost reminds me of the self-esteem movement in the 70s, the failed self-esteem movement of non-conditioned rule. Um, Non-contingent -con ideas of that as a child, anything is humanly possible. Now we're talking about 11, 12 year olds. You could possibly do anything. Well, no, it's part of it is gauging what are your strengths, what are your interests, what are your passions. Some things are not good fits for some people. And that's a very nuanced thing that sort of doesn't work well of just purely positive self affirmations. Yeah, um, what we're really talking about here is, is a mindset of being open, receptive, and aware of what's happening, what is it we care about what's going on in the present moment, being present and being open to how things are. This allows us to really connect with other people and connect with the things that we do. And nothing to say in the mirror to yourself. Nothing, is what? nothing to say in the mirror to yourself. I'm a good person. Yes. So tomorrow, if you want to be more curious, what would be the first thing you'd do? Pick an activity that you're trapped in and change and, and be aware of what's happening right there. If you're commute to work, how many times do we end up driving and we end up all of a sudden we have no idea how we get home other than the fact that we have a built-in schematic framework like uh, the Terminator of it just gets me from point A to point B. Uh, what's on the side of the road? Do you even know what, what types of architecture in terms of houses are even on the side of the road? Have you recognized how it changes from every two minutes types of the houses sort of changing? The fauna and flora house changing as a seat right in between seasons right now. You know, just those moments, you're building this muscle. You're building the connective tissue of, when I look at things, I'm not gonna quickly quickly categorize things into, it's fall. Nice big houses here with lots of bedrooms in Fairfax, Virginia. Of the idea of getting more specific, looking for those details, looking for all those novelty, the novelties that are arising there. And these little moments, those, those are the building blocks for fulfilling life, are, those, are these nice, energizing, open moments. If a person spends a lot of their time, they feel a lot of special listening to you today, if a person recognizes they spend a lot of time kind of rethinking the past and the way they have done something different, and anxiety or fear or whatever about the future, do you have kind of a, I don't want to say easy, but technique to Continually bring yourself back to the present and mindfulness? Yeah, yeah, this is not a... Uh, it's not easy to do, is it? Yeah, I just wrote a whole chapter about this, about how to... This, this natural conflict between anxiety and exploration, avoidance and exploring, that we make on a daily basis. In terms of, do I go out of my office and go talk to my colleagues, or do I go back to go doing my work? Because I'm not really feeling in my body that comfortable right now anyway. These are, but it's important to me to have strong relationships with my coworkers. If that is, that helps to become your confidence to guide you of which direction to take between the two. So I wrote a whole chapter that details it. Um, but if you ever have any questions about it, you can send me an email and flush it out with even more details about very particular exercises that kind of can do that. Nothing I can talk about in a minute or less. Which chapter is that? Um, I think it's anxiety is in the title. Maybe chapter seven. At this point, I know that you'll have lots more questions, and I invite you to talk further with Todd out in the lobby or down here. Uh, but I wanted to thank you for coming. Uh, this